Hello, everybody. Just popping in at the beginning of the episode today to do a warning on today's content. We will be discussing age gap relationships, grooming, consent, and sexual assault on the podcast today as per the content of the issue. We hope that we've discussed these issues with the requisite sensitivity, but of course, you know your mileage, which is why we're doing the warning up front. On to the episode. Behold! The sword of power, Excalibur. Welcome to episode 25 of the Oh Gosh, Oh Golly, Oh Wow podcast, the podcast where we talk about the Marvel comic series Excalibur and nothing but Excalibur every week for 126 plus weeks. This week in episode 25, we're still, still on the cross tide caper when we're not turning 15 again in Paris with Excalibur number 24, Tempting Fates, originally published in July 1990. The creative team is Chris Claremont on writing, Alan Davis on pencils, Paul Meary on inks, Glynis Oliver on colors, Tom Orzachowski on letters, and Terry Kavanaugh on editing. Excalibur. Is it true? Take it quickly! Lots to talk about in this issue, and we've got a stupendously smart guest to talk about it with us, who I will introduce in a moment. But first, your honored hosts. I am Dr. Anna Papard. You've heard the intro before. You know I do lots of things. If you're in academia, you can find me in the usual academic journals and whatnot. You can also check out my award-winning book, Super Sex, Sexuality, Fantasy, and the Superhero, and find me writing for various websites like Shelf Dust and The Middle Spaces and Comics XF. I do all of those things on autopilot while prioritizing my main job, which hasn't paid me cash money yet, but it's only a matter of time as Kurt Wagner's unofficial PR manager. Mav, tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, I'm Captain Pittsburgh because apparently you can just be captain of a city like or or a place. Just you can just take it. That's how this book works. I've learned that today. It doesn't matter if it's Britain or somewhere else. So I'm just going to be the captain of Pittsburgh now. That's my, my new thing. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> yeah, it also pays it pays about as much as being Kurt Wagner's uh, <laughs> PR manager as it turns out. <laughs> um, but beyond that, I'm an adjunct instructor at University of Duquesne and uh, Mount Aloysius College, both of which are in Pennsylvania. Uh, study literature and comics and pop culture and depictions of race and sexuality and class therein from everything from you know from comic books to professional wrestling so that's the kind of thing i do i am the host of another podcast called vox popcast which talks about a different pop culture subject every week and of this one where we talk about just excalibur both extremes <laughs> so so um we are well, this is fun because i guess it's like you said we're still in the cross time caper but i guess this is the end of it kind of you know, we're almost, kinda. I know. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, it's going to be a fun discussion today. I'm, I, we're to, a, we're to an, epi- to an episode that I like, you know, sometimes I don't like them. I like this one. <laughs> <laughs> one of our last Davis issues for a while, unfortunately, but, um, yeah, but I like we'll it. make the most of it. Yeah. <laughs> and, Andrew, tell us a little bit about yourself. I'm Dr. Andrew Demann. I am a, um, person who writes about comics a lot. <laughs> and is the project <laughs> lead for the Claremont run. Uh, and I'm on faculty at the University of Waterloo, um, and I'm very intimidated by today's guest, and I'm just trying oh. to like spend the next hour not acting like a goon who was born, raised, and educated two hours from the Subtantra, and <laughs> then I will get out of this feeling good about myself. 
Wow. Wow. Andrew, I don't know how we're going to walk back from that level of self-deprecation, but we'll do our best. So we are joined this week by a woman who's both a Kitty Pride mega fan and a professor at Harvard University. Yes, that Harvard University, none other than Dr. Stephanie Burt. Welcome, Stephanie. Uh, hi, it's really seriously an honor to be here. And um, as someone who's on Twitter too much, I can <laughs> say that I am a little bit uh, intimidated myself by the amazing concise insights into storytelling comics form and the political and social context for those things that the Claremont run Twitter feed has been producing in addition to the uh you know long form academic work uh that some of our guests some some of our hosts rather have put before this guest uh and I do hope that you check out Super Sex uh, if you read academic books at all it's a good one yeah Stephanie Burt is a literary critic and poet, a professor at Harvard, as we mentioned. The New York Times has called her one of the most influential poetry critics of her generation. She has published four collections of poetry and voluminous literary criticism and research. Additional work has appeared in the New York Times, Book Review, the London Review of Books, Times Literary Supplement, The Believer, the Boston Review, and many other places. Wikipedia also notes her popular press writing, including an article about X-Men Days of Future Past in the voice of Kitty Pride, which we will link in our show notes. Not noted on Wikipedia is the fact that Stephanie is also a regular contributor to the website Comics XF, which is where I've been lucky enough to interact with her. So let's come back to that origin story, Stephanie. I know you've got a deep affection for Kitty, but I don't really know much about your comics history. So what is your X-Men origin story? So I am so old that <laughs> I, I'm, yeah, no. You're gonna um, say you're gonna say that something, and then you're just gonna, I'm gonna realize that you're younger than I am, and I'm just yeah. gonna cry. So just, <laughs> I'll just, just I'll just say it. I'm fifty. I'm, you're not. I'm just barely. I'm not younger than you are. <laughs> Thank um, you. Because that's happened before. People usually go, "I'm so old," and I'm like, "Oh, you're a decade younger than me." <laughs> no, I'm actually older than you. Although I'm, I, I over-identify with uh, Red Queen Captain Kate Pride, who is Kitty in in this issue. Uh, enough that I'm tempted just to take it a step further and say that no one knows how old I am and if you start discussing it you'll get in trouble and the only thing that we know is that Warren Ellis does not know yeah. yes. <laughs> <laughs> niche joke uh, anyway uh, I uh, in, in some sense I'm still turning 15 but uh, I am also 50 and that means that I was able to buy uh, some of the great Claremont Run issues in drugstores at the Cabin John Mini Mart in Potomac, Maryland, <laughs> where I lived in grade school. And I was not very good at being a kid or very fun to be around as a kid, uh, but I definitely loved reading comics. Uh, and I, you know, my first issue was X-Men 121, Uncanny X-Men 121, the debut of Alpha Flight, speaking of the sub-tundra. Um, so I knew where, I knew where Calgary was before I knew where Paris was. And I thought that Calgary and Vancouver and Ottawa were three of the most important cities in the world. Um, Accurate. because that's where I came in. And, uh, like a lot of people, I discovered new interests in my mid teens and stopped reading superhero comics for a while. And then realized that I should go back and see what happens, which means uh, I was lucky. I missed the nineties. And by the time I really got back into it, it was, uh, you know, X-Comics were good again. I missed the Morrison era, but I kind of came in during the Bendis era and got very seriously back into X-Fandom as an adult as I realized that this was my community and this was my trans and queer community. And um, I don't know that my you know trajectory would have been the same without the friends I've made in the, I mean, no, I would know it would have been worse and different without the friends I made through X fandom in various parts of various countries and without X podcasts starting, you will not be surprised to hear with Jay and Miles explain the X-Men, yes. uh, but with yes. other friends I've made through other podcasts, uh, you know, this one and Xavier Files, which turned in, sorry, Battle of the Atom, which is also the Xavier Files website, which turned into Comics XF, for which Anna also writes. And I really feel like this community was here waiting for me as it was waiting for a lot of us. Uh, and it does seem to have nurtured a lot of trans and queer folk, mm -hmm. as well as a lot of neurodiverse and disabled folk. And now that it's would be quite hard for Harvard to fire me. They'd have to fire me for cause. And I hope I never get for cause. <laughs> I can uh, 
I, I like poetry just as much as I ever did, but I can also do more comic stuff. And I've really enjoyed organizing some courses around comics and around ex-comics and seeing how far the mutant metaphor extends. Now, that's my comics history, and it's my ex-history. My Excalibur history is that by the time Excalibur happened, I was busy trying to be a cool kid and <laughs> trying to be an indie rocker and <laughs> learning, a lot about, uh, learning a lot about contemporary poetry, and I wasn't reading X-Comics anymore. Um, I would love to say that I stuck with X-Comics right around the time that Claremont left uh, and then in 1991 hit the eject button, but I'm not that cool and I'm not that discerning. I stopped reading X-Comics in between the Mutant Massacre and Fall of the Mutants, if that helps, which means that I was yes. off the train right before it started. Excalibur started. And my, my, Excalibur, <laughs> my Excalibur fandom comes entirely as an adult. I'd never read an issue of this comic until I was in my 40s, and I love it. And it is very head spinning, and I'm still adjusting to a couple things that are unique to what Claremont and Davis are doing with this title. But as part of the larger universe of these characters I love, I just felt right at home. Aww. Yeah, I'm very curious about... Well, I mean, now let's talk a little bit about it now, because we can get to the issue summary. But like, where does kind of your particular kind of affection for, for Kitty come in? Was she always your favorite character when you were reading the comics when you were younger? Oh, wow. Uh, I love that question. Uh, and since we're not live, you can boil me down <laughs> or edit me if I go on too long. Uh, <laughs> so so cool. I, I will go on about that. Um, I now realize that Kitty was always my character. The character who was my, I, I've, I've had the feeling for a very long time that things that happened to Kate Pride happened to me. It is not necessarily a healthy feeling. It's not oh. the best way to talk <laughs> comics critic or anything critic. But, uh, you know, as, as Auden says, we cannot choose who we are free to love. I didn't realize how thoroughly I was her when I was a grade schooler and a middle schooler reading X comics, um, she was a, uh, one of a double handful of characters I liked because I didn't know I was a girl. I didn't know I could be a girl. I wanted to be a girl, but I thought that was a little less likely than being an astronaut or being a commoted <laughs> dragon. Yeah. Um, you know, I didn't. I didn't know. I remember, um, um, at, at that at that time, if you knew that there were trans people, you thought either that we were uh, very seriously mentally ill, or if you were lucky, you knew that there were trans people and that we could transition. But you knew that it was very, very hard, and you had to blow up your life and start over, and everyone would hate you. And also, you shouldn't do it unless you were suicidal. Mm -hmm. And also. To be really trans, you had to be straight. That is, the fact that I liked girls and wanted to be a girl and kiss girls meant that I was just a weird boy who, who wanted to be a girl because if I really was supposed to be a girl, I'd like guys. Um, again, you know, we know better now, but it was very hard to know better uh, when, uh, you know, Kitty debuts as a character when X-Men 129 comes out um, with its intense and continuing bisexual subtext. Um, so I knew I liked Kitty. I didn't understand that I liked her more deeply than I liked the other characters I was into. For example, uh, I was a real Legion of Superheroes fan during the Giffen Levitz run, which is a perfectly good comics run, but doesn't hold up as literature in the way that, you know, the Brood Saga, I would say, does, or uh, most of Claremont New Mutants does, or parts of Excalibur. Uh, you know, I, I liked Wildfire. I liked a lot. I liked the Legion of Superheroes because there were just so many damn characters. And if you didn't see yourself in one, you could just wait two pages and there'd be five <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I liked Legion of Superheroes as a reader for the same reason that artists hated drawing the Legion of Superheroes you know I, I read the Wolf and Perez Teen Titans and I uh, rereading all these comics I loved as an adult, I realized first that I loved teen comics because more things can happen to teenagers and teenagers can always grow and change and are less likely to have stories in which they have to be resigned to things they can't fix. And I also realized that the queer liberation subtext that and the just it's okay to be weird and form your own community and find chosen family subtext that I was finding in old Teen Titans comics was there because I had put it there and uh, in Legion of Superheroes comics, it was sort of there, but the characters were kind of flat because there were 500 of them. Uh, mm -hmm. And in X comics, it was there because extremely talented writers and editors like Anna Senti and Louis Simonson and artists had put it there. And I, I learned more as an adult and as someone who wanted to write about comics about 
why why I continued to be Kitty. And it turned into a poem that I published in, it's in my second book, Parallel Play, my second book of poems called Self-Portrait is Kitty Pride, which I published at a time when I was very out of touch with organized ex-fandom when, you know, the podcasts mm-hmm. weren't there and fanfic exists, existed, but I wasn't writing or reading it yet. And it wasn't part of a fan community, but I wanted to be. And I published that poem and I loved reading it at readings and people would come out to me as ex-fans and I realized that there was something there and I continued to write, you know, criticism and poetry uh, and fanfic of various kinds, um, some of which is absolutely PG rated and I won't <laughs> give you my pseudonym, but it's you find. Um, I realized that this was my community. Uh, but, you know, why... Why Kitty? Well, I don't see her as I don't see her as trans. I know people who do. I don't. There are several ex characters who are very very easy to see as they don't talk about it, but they are non binary. They are gender fluid. Megan is gender fluid, and this podcast has talked about it. Several other ex characters, it's quite easy to see as binary trans, and those are possible head cannons. There are ways of seeing both Scott and Logan as trans masculine if that's what you want. There are very compelling ways of seeing Emma Frost as trans feminine, and I kind of like that. I don't read Kitty as low-key trans, but I do read her as someone whose power set and whose difficulties are very, very good allegories for the kind of trans identity that I have and whose other characteristics really map onto who I am and what I can do and how it feels to be me. Her power set is very trans because it's about not having a body. And it in particular goes with being a, a relatively fortunate trans girl who is who has friends, who's valued for what she can do as a friend, for what she can do as a student. It's very important to Kitty's character uh, that she's super smart and that adults get along with her very well. And she really has no problem relating to adults because they find her winsome and charming and cute. And she's the youngest person in a room of adults and she's welcome there and they're down with that and she's used to that and oh boy does she ace her tests and that was absolutely me she's also from privilege and she has a great deal of white privilege and suburban privilege and economic privilege and she comes unevenly and sometimes awkwardly or cringe inducingly to realize that but that's also me i'm a white girl who's from washington dc which is a majority black city with very very rich black history and um i'm you know, grew up pretty well to do. I am from parents who were in a fairly conventional marriage and actually still are, unlike Kitty's parents. They are right for each other and never split up. But I'm from, you know, haute bourgeois privilege. And as I made more friends at science fiction conventions and in college and in life and in indie rock and in comics, um, I encountered more and more people who didn't have the privileges that I had. Kitty also has passing privilege. A number of her stories. This morning I taught on X-Men Unlimited number 22. Uh, which is possibly the best 90s non-Claremont kitty story um, where Mero, who cannot pass and considers mm-hmm. herself ugly, mm-hmm. has a giant mm-hmm. crush on Kitty. Mm-hmm. She I know the issue. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it teaches very well. And, you know, Kitty can pass. Uh, she gives that great speech in, I think it's the Bendis-written All-New X-Men 13, uh, where she says, you can't tell I'm Jewish by looking at me. I don't have a Jewish mm-hmm. last name. But I am Jewish, and I'm a mutant, and I want people to know. And I'm very down with that. I'm also Jewish. I, pro- I My Jewish identity is sometimes visible and sometimes not, as with Kitty. I don't have a Jewish last name. Most people name Bert are English or Scottish. Um, there is a Burt Castle in County Donegal, Ireland, and it's next to Buncrana where they make Fruit of Loom underwear. Uh, I am not related to those Burt. My last name is actually Burt. It should be Burt, which means bearded because my male ancestors were beards because they were Jewish and they, you know, cut their hair. Um, but yeah, so, so uh, you know, Jewish white, large city in a blue place, as we say now, haute bourgeois, gifted child, comfortable around adults, really, uh, you know, extroverted, uh, wanted to fit in with my peers, really wanted friends, susceptible to manipulation by popular kids, which is part of what we'll discuss today. Um, But also, you know, wanting to include the nerds, being very much someone who, who wants to be able to go in between the popular kids and the nerds, the the kids and the adults, uh, and someone who's extremely, extremely comfortable in schools. Another thing about Excalibur Kitty is that Excalibur is the first time in her life that she hasn't been in a school. Yeah, yeah. She spends most of her life in schools, and she is so comfortable being in a school, either as a student 
or as a teacher, that mm-hmm. when she decides in the 90s to not be an X-Man for a while and Excalibur has dissolved, she goes off to the University of Chicago and gets some degrees. And House of M. Kitty is a high school teacher in Cincinnati. A high school teacher, yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Kitty has until the Krakoan era, Kitty has never been really comfortable and accepted being anything other than a student or a teacher. And I vibe with that. That's me. And she really, really wants peers. She wants a girlfriend. She sometimes wants a boyfriend. She's bi. I'm, I wouldn't categorize myself as bi because they don't date men, but I'm queer. She sometimes wants a boyfriend that never really works out. She definitely wants a girlfriend or two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and she wants she wants to be accepted and feel popular and she always feels comfortable in school settings and awkward and extroverted outside school settings and all of that is a hundred percent me i even wear a lot of blue she also has a power set that is extremely me and is extremely trans because she is disembodied her default state and that's it's not mentioned in issue 24 but it's discussed in i believe 22 i think 21 and 22 where she finds herself back on earth the queen six she's someone whose default state is phased during most of Excalibur, and and that comes up every so often, and it's true for a very long time. She's someone who needs to concentrate in order to have a body, because normally she's just a power set and a brain. And if you felt very at home in school, but you didn't feel at home in your body because, you know, (laughs) you needed to transition and you didn't know it, uh, I am very much down with that. Uh, That is is one of the prototypical trans experiences, and one of the things that eggs tend to say. And and discovering that your consciousness is also at home in a robot, which is also very Excalibur, not to look ahead yeah. too long. Um, <laughs> that's also very trans. So there are aspects of uh, her current title is Red Queen Captain Kate Pride, but she's Kitty now. There are aspects of Kitty that allegorize trans experience and binary trans feminine experience very well uh, and most of her other aspects just describe me the big differences are i uh live on this earth earth 1218 not earth six <laughs> um my hair is never that awesome <laughs> we've and talked about her hair before no no one's is <laughs> no one's is no especially on james hair um i try i'm gr- finally growing it out but it's you know not the same and i was people because of my affects and because of my interests um when i was growing up i people very frequently believed that i was super great at cs at computer programming and at the physical sciences and at mathematics and i find those things fascinating but as an amateur turns out uh that the things i'm good enough at to get a job in uh mostly involve throwing words around (laughs) So, yeah, same, same all around. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I cannot hack your program for you, but I can, if someone else hacks it, I can write an essay about what their hacking means. <laughs> Oh, this is so beautiful, Stephanie. I'm just like, we're not doing video, but I'm just like nodding so hard through the whole yeah. thing. And it's like making my brain fire on so many cylinders about talking mm-hmm. about ways that I identify with Nightcrawler that I haven't talked about before. But we will not talk about that on this podcast. We're going to well, stay focused this, mostly on Kitty. <laughs> I mean, this isn't the issue for that because it's not a very crit no. issue, though we will talk about Megan finally becoming Nightcrawler yeah. uh, yes. which in, in your recent coverage complained about not happening. I, the other thing I want to show you, and I should mention it, is that uh, you know now that I'm part of a number of overlapping queer fandom communities, that my friend Fiona, um, who is Squirrel Girl in the way that uh, I am Shadowcat, uh, knits and made this amazing knitted Lockheed that I forgot to wave around when we were doing our video sound check. <laughs> and um, I, I want to show it to you. If you can imagine just somebody knitting a, 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 lo- a purple Lockheed that is at about, I would say, at 50% scale of the real Lockheed. And yes, there is a real Lockheed. All of this is real. It's all real. It's <laughs> Um, if you can imagine an absolutely perfect knitted fifty percent scale Lockheed, I'm holding, I'm holding him right now. Oh. We, we, yeah, we we want a picture for the website and for the YouTube video, and also we want your friends because I want to buy one, um, like a lot, like really badly. Um, so <laughs> this is the most important thing I'm in my just, life now. I've just like dissolved in a puddle of hearts. 
<laughs> for the listener, my birthday is like in three weeks. So, you know, seriously, <laughs> <No. everyone. laughs> right now she has a uh, full time programming job and is the GM at about four different RPGs. So I, I don't want to promise a timetable, but uh, I will I will ask her. Um, totally okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> oh, <I didn't... laughs> All right, well, you do that. I will oh, yeah. get to the very boring image uh, issue summary, and then we oh, can yeah, get we back have to, to that. some yeah, of these. We, have a show we still haven't even done that. We got like right. we got enthralled by this Kitty Pride discussion, but it will be brief, and we'll come back and, and get into the, to the issue at hand, because there's still so much to talk about. So, we open with a split screen or page featuring on one side Opal, Luna, Saturnine, Omniversal, Mastrix, Reprimanding, Excalibur for their dimension hopping exploits and vowing to deal with Phoenix once and for all. On the other side, we have her twin, Courtney Ross, who is still and forevermore the evil Saturn 9 in disguise, or as I've taken to calling her, Saturn Courtney. Saturn Courtney is surprising her ward, Kitty Pride, in bed with a birthday cake. Kitty is turning 15. Again, don't question it. Saturn 9 comforts Kitty, who's still missing her Excalibur teammates, promising Kitty a birthday party she'll remember forever. She also invites Kitty to suck gooey icing off of her finger. We will talk about it. We cut from Kitty's bedroom in the 616 to Excalibur's train arriving at the Omniversal Hub. Nightcrawler comes up with a brilliant plan to disguise Rachel as Kitty so as not to let her be captured by the Mastrix and her goons. Like all of Kurt's seemingly ridiculous plans, it works. Back in 616 London, Satter Courtney takes Kitty to be measured for a new dress. Later, she escorts the newly dolled up Kitty to a fancy London restaurant where they drink champagne and toast their bright futures. Meanwhile, in the Omniversal Hub, Excalibur are dealing with an inspector who grumpily edits their character histories in an enormous tome in response to their latest cross time adventures. The inspector is suspicious of Rachel disguised as Kitty, but chalks up her difference in height and body type to an archival error. Then the team splits up. Brian attempts to convince the Maastricht to let Phoenix go, while Kurt experiences the moment he's been waiting for his whole life, getting to have a fencing duel with a musketeer looking dude. He immediately loses, but is saved by Megan, which is probably his real fantasy anyway. Back in London, Satter Courtney flies Kitty to Paris on a private jet, where they go to a jazz club, then dance the night away on a boat with some new friends. In the morning, Satter Courtney gifts Kitty a new car, a red jaguar, which she and Satter Courtney drive off into the dawn. Things come to a head in our final check-in with the Omniversal Hub. Rachel busts out of a trap meant for Kitty, but in the end, it doesn't matter. The Mastrix pretends not to notice Kitty as Rachel, and tells Excalibur she is recalibrated Widget to take them home. The train arrives in a cave, but Excalibur knows they're home. They are not, however, out of danger. Galactus is looming above them. So, we've got lots of good stuff in this issue, lots and lots of good stuff. Some of it problematic, but all of it interesting. So let's dive right in. Starting with you, Stephanie. So first impressions of this issue. I think that you liked it. I remember you tweeting about it shortly after I invited you for this episode. So let's just start there. Like, what did you particularly enjoy about this issue? What are you particularly anxious to talk about? Okay, so this issue has an A plot and a B plot. Mm -hmm. And the A plot is the one that everyone remembers, the famous parts, the ones that Mm -hmm. that we're probably going to spend a little more time on, uh, involves only one member of Excalibur. It's Kitty's 15th birthday celebration in which uh, the adult, very adult satire Courtney uh, decides that she's going to have the best birthday ever and gives her all the best stuff and sort of seduces her. Um, sort or, of, yeah. Sort of? <laughs> so, sort of? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. So, so there's that. And um, the first, remember, these are these are comics that I only read as an adult. And my reaction to that when I first read it was, this is sketchy as hell, <laughs> uh-huh. which is not wrong. Yeah. But as I reread it, you know, looking for nuance, I discovered that I liked it more. And satire Courtney's behavior is still wildly unethical, but it's much easier to believe that Kitty comes away from this issue thinking that was a really wonderful night that was really fun that was great rather than i have just been initiated into a hella sketchy sexual relationship with an adult and it's extremely awful and creepy and and not not in the way that that in real life uh you know people who are groomed by predators like there's a phase of that 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 if you read memoirs or listen to people who've been victims say you know hey that felt good while it was happening but now i realize it was terrible more like wow, that was close to the line and, and kind of felt weird a little bit. Uh, but on balance, it was a good experience. And it's it's possible for me to imagine her looking back now, like the adult kitty looking back and saying, uh, Satire Courtney was not a good person. That was a really lovely evening. I'm finding it easier to enjoy that A-plot now than I did the first time I read it, even though it is 
still hella sketchy. That's my sort of overall take on that. And I can talk about why when we get there. But I don't want to neglect the B-plot, which is delightful, not in its own uniquely sketchy way. So we'll get back to that. But there's also a B-plot, uh, which is more consequential for this series because it's how everybody who's not Kitty gets to go home and it involves fencing and shape-shifting and disguise and doubling and it's another one of those stories where we see five million captains britain and non, <laughs> non-british readers uh learn or are reminded that uh britain is a nation state composed of four countries that don't necessarily even like each other very much plus uh, everybody hates london um <laughs> doesn't live there half the time that there's a sort of right there's regionalism um it does the thing that excalibur often does which is to educate non-british people uh about basic european geography and it's so much fun and i don't want to neglect the b-plot yeah i mean i love that you are calling it like a plot and b-plot because it is like usually in a superhero comic the kind of domestic character building thing would be the b-plot but it's definitely the opposite it in this particular issue i'm pretty sure it's not supposed to be i mean she's right it is like because uh, when you said that it's what everybody remembers i've read this series all the way through i think this is my fifth time as we as we do the show right so and i've reread this book like a couple of times in you know just in preparation for this show every time through i forget how i forget the details of how excalibur got home i know i, I know saturnine just sends them home because she's bored with it and like and that's what i remember right? like i forget the details of this plot entirely so i agree with you that this is the Excalibur story is the B plot and the Kitty story is the A plot. I thought I was going to have to defend that on my own here because I, I don't because I don't think no. I don't think it's supposed. Well, I mean, okay, actually, I it's not surprising to me that any of you feel that way, but I don't think it's supposed to be that way. I think that Kitty is supposed to be the subplot that is just like sort of, and now we're beginning this now little this side adventure that you know is going to take the next no. fifteen year issues to. No. But I I think that's what it's supposed to be, but it isn't. It's it, it's clearly the more more important thing. I don't really care okay. whether Rachel can wear a costume. <laughs> oh, I I mean. I really like the the Rachel costume stuff. It, yeah, and and I mean the, this this okay. is this is so Claremonty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that it is. There's so much doubling, and there's so much queer subtext, and there's mm-hmm. it's so. I mean, Kitty has really two. Kitty has two and a half healthy erotic relationships over the course of her life. I would say. Oh, which um, one? Well, I was I was like that many. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I, oh, I would see more, but, but, but <laughs> which ones? <laughs> Two and a half, Ilyana, Rachel, and um, her relation. I would say that her relationship with Peter Quill is healthy because it begins when it begins, it ends when it ends. They have fun together, yeah. and okay. then it ends. They're not meant to I, be. I don't yeah. think of them as healthy, but okay. I, yeah, yeah. I, won't, I, won't de- I won't debate that point. I think that's yeah. a valid reading. I think it. it's a valid reading, yeah. He's, he's, not a, he's not a good boyfriend, but he yes. like, he's not a creeper. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and they're clearly the way they're... I mean, this is Excalibur isn't a comic that's running when that's happening, but they're having fun together, and I don't mind reading about that relationship, even though uh, I want her to have time for her girlfriends, and she's very busy, so I certainly don't mind when they break up. Um, yes. Plus, she belongs on her with trips into space not the reverse in any case back to Excalibur (laughs) one of the things that this does and I sort of defer to Andrew on this but I guess I'm going to bring it in anyway as in in Shakespeare as in a lot of Claremont as in uh, most good you know playwriting anywhere there's an A plot and a B plot the B plot illuminates the A plot because uh, is this really something Kitty would do does this look like Kitty is this costume on the person who seems like Kitty really going to fit it and huh kitty looks pretty grown up are you sure that's really her boy i guess she's just grown up are questions you can ask both about the uh, earth plot and about the space plot the team plot when the i don't know what to call him the sort of customs guy at the border between universes who's trying to figure out if the rest of the team can get in to see uh the the majestrix says you know you look taller and more full-figured and uh rachel dressed as kitty says 
as well, you know, people grow. That is a character beat that we are going to see both in universe, where it's part of who Kitty is. How old is she really? She's never had peers, uh, except in a couple of New Mutants issues, and with Ilyana, who's so traumatized that, that she's unstuck in time, right? Is Kitty a child? Is she an adult? Why do the adults treat her like an adult, except when they treat her as a child? What is her relationship to the age grading of modern society? Why is it so out of whack? And why is it wrong? Uh, although, you know, it is wrong. It's sketchy as hell. For Courtney to treat her as capable of adult sexuality when she's so clearly capable of a lot of adult other things like saving the world. Courtney is still behaving in a wildly unethical way and doing things uh, that are, uh, you know, firing offenses. Because normally in Claremont written subtext, when the artist knows what they're doing, you assume that the people slept together off panel, right? Uh, when you see Kitty and Ilyana, who are who are the same age and who know each other very well and who are uh, wonderful as each other's firsts, do things like this, you assume that they are uh, experiencing, you know, non-age gap, non-power gap, enthusiastic consent, doing things between the pages and between the panels. I had remembered this issue as even sketchier than it is because I had remembered it as enforcing that kind of Claremontian reading. And it actually doesn't. If, if you just see what's on page what you get is inappropriate flirting again yeah. not okay coupled with let me show you a wonderful night out in which kitty spends a good deal of time flirting with guys and then gets academics <laughs> academics yeah. Yeah. yeah academics and and uh you know musicians and then she gets a car uh so it's less horrifyingly inappropriate than a lot of people remember if you just pay attention to what's on page and it speaks more than i had remembered to the liminal and unstable space that Kitty has spent her entire on-page life occupying and would continue to occupy really until she became the assistant head of a school during the Aaron Wolverine and the X-Men, which is how old is she? Is she a teen? Is she an adult? Uh, does she have any peers? Can she have any peers? Is she doomed always to be the youngest or to be the teacher? Who the heck knows? And the sophistication of of Paris. It's something she's always wanted and she's being shown by someone who she for the moment trusts. And I actually really believe in her growing into herself a little bit and and having fun. And as again, I didn't I didn't see this until I reread it. Um, and there is an entire very, very controversial and almost got the University of Minnesota press shut down for publishing it. A book about age gap relationships by a very thoughtful scholar, a sociologist named Judith Levine called Harmful to Minors, which is a, a very careful book that, that I recommend that argues explain its argument. It argues that adults trying to insulate minors from anything that looks like sex ed until they turn 18 is counterproductive. And it describes Judith Levine's own very anomalous experience in a relationship that was in retrospect sketchy as hell, but from which she as a competent adult scholar believes that she benefited. Again, content warnings on the episode, content warnings on the issue. The idea that, that Kitty looks back on this night with mostly joy even though she knows that Courtney was not sad how Courtney was bad that's plausible to me now and I think that that I can see it being written and drawn with that in mind that said Alan Davis has said Chris didn't tell me exactly how to draw this so I just drew a lesbian seduction that is how mm -hmm. it looks that's an interview yeah. that's, that's textual yeah yeah, yeah. And well I want to I want to bring in some different gazes on this because I I know that like Andrew and Mav you guys probably read it when you were teenagers I I had lots of thoughts about it. Listening to Stephanie talk about it is sort of amazing, like seeing someone with an alternate viewpoint. Because here's where I, I, I absolutely agree with Stephanie that Courtney and I think the book goes out of its way to tell you Kitty and Courtney did not sleep together this night. Yeah, and it's very yeah, important yeah. that you understand that no they sex spend the happened night separately. Yeah. <laughs> yes, because right. because That's last right. time, like Court, yeah, Courtney watches her float away on a boat and watches her walk you know walk of shame herself back in the morning so <laughs> it literally and 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 i was aware of that at let's see 1990 i'm i'm 15, 16 when i'm reading this probably and i was very aware that this that that's what you wanted you know, the book wanted us to say i was like wow they're flirting very hard you know 
as a boy, I was aware of, wow, this is clearly, you know, Cor uh, Courtney at Saturn 9 trying to seduce her. I was aware of that. And then it's like, oh, and Kitty floated away on the boat and walks back smiling. Who did she sleep with that night is a question that happened in my head. So I feel like they wanted me to think of it that way. I feel like this is a seduction where we have put the sex part off on a normatively hetero kind of, you know, space, even though Courtney did all the work. We just we're just going to shove it off and just have her float away on a boat. That said, just a little fast forwarding into the future, most of the readings that I get of the two characters post this uh, this issue for, you know, going forward for the next 20 or so issues of 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 where Excalibur is going to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are very much going to read as though no there was a sexual relationship between courtney yeah. and kitty and so yeah. um it just spoilers next time we see them they're on a train together and who knows what happened who yeah. knows what happened after they drove away in the car in this in this issue so i think it, it wants to have it both ways it wants to have it look we're gonna do a very very and i agree with you sketchy ultimately and i knew that then i knew that as, as a 16 year old you know the excalibur is weird because this is the portion of excalibur where kitty and i really are the same age right i'm reading this in the same space as her and i was aware that wow that 40 year old woman is totally trying to sleep with this 15 year old girl that's probably bad like i like i like i knew that then yeah i'm realizing okay first I, I feel like I need to clarify two things. First, mm -hmm. I'm talking about this issue and what's written and drawn in this issue. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and yeah what yeah. happens next. Second, I'm seeing how different it is to read it and from Kitty's viewpoint to to have to feel that if it, it it looks it looks one way if you're someone who 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 wants to if someone who wants to be Kitty, and it looks another way. If you're one of the many, many readers of X Comics who wanted to uh, be with Kitty, or if you just aren't identifying with anyone in, in, in the book, um, and it's maybe easier to process if you you tend to read comics with Kitty in them from her point of view, maybe. The thing that you're making me think about is like, okay, I don't like this scene, although I think it's a very important and interesting scene because I don't, a lot of the conversations I think that we can have about this scene are very similar to kind of the conversations we had about the Warlord issue where we talked about issues of consent there as well. And I made the argument there that, you know, some of the sexy things that happen with Kurt in that issue are still sexy regardless of the context and you can still take the images on their own and those images can have a power and you know we have agency as readers to kind of interpret these things how we want to interpret them and especially when we're talking about gazes that the superhero genre neglects that can be really really important so I think this is a really really complex scene and that's why I think it's important to talk about sort of multiple gazes and multiple ways you can read that because I think the multiplicity is intentional and inevitable given this is the comics code era and they couldn't have done this as an overtly queer story even if they'd wanted to right so there's a lot going on here but I think my reaction to the scene is that I'm coming at it from I often have a lot of trouble identifying with female characters in superhero comics. Female characters in superhero comics make me feel very vulnerable and when I try to identify with them there's always going to be an issue where they're just objectified all to hell and then I feel unsafe. So I usually identify with male characters like Nightcrawler. Nightcrawler has sort of a gender fluidity that kind of makes that a little bit more accessible for me and that's part of what goes on with my identification with him. But so in this scene I put myself in Kitty's position and I'm terrified. Like I'm just terrified. I have like this like intense like oh god I don't want to be in this situation. I don't want to be in this situation, not because of the queer stuff, but like because of the like abusey angle stuff. And it just makes me super, super anxious. And I can't divorce myself from that reaction. I just like get super, super uptight at the scene. And like, it's just so interesting, like the ways that we encounter it at different points in our lives, the way that we're sort of coming at it with sort of different needs and experiences and desires, I just think is what makes the scene so fascinating though. And like, I want to bring Andrew into the conversation because we haven't heard from you in ages, Andrew, but did you read this? Did you, <laughs> did you read this? Doing. No, 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 no. I want to. I want to hear from you, Andrew. You're the Claremont scholar. But did you have an experience reading this comic growing up, or did you only come at, come back to it as an adult? I, I think my view on it has refined a little bit as, as an adult. Yeah. But as a as a teen, I never had a problem identifying with Kitty. I think that's something that's really powerful about her as a character. Like I don't have any of the the sort of connections that Stephanie mentioned to the character, and I still have no problem. Just You're like, good at school. Jumping in. <laughs> <laughs> but um. 
like what Stephanie was saying, like, I, I do think that the two stories are, are linked. I, I think they're linked through this theme of transportation, literal and figurative. Yeah. Uh, and through the whole Pygmalion intertextuality, the idea of trying something on and sort of faking it until you make it. But for like the ethics of the kitty thing, there's a few things I've thought of. Like, it's very sketchy, but I like it as a sort of from Kitty's perspective, sexual wish fulfillment fantasy. The, the ethics of consent are monstrous there. Uh, and we know that Kitty is consumed in two different ways by two different audiences or sometimes simultaneously by the same audience. But I would say that, that one thing that kind of stands out to me is when Courtney offers her the icing, I think that's meant to be symbolic consent. I think that's her saying, do you want to come for this ride? And Kitty's saying, yes. Now, Kitty is not old enough to consent. And obviously, metaphorical consent is not informed consent. But I think that's what Claremont was trying to set up. I just, the- I just, I put myself immediately in that position. I'm like, if an adult did that to me and I was a little too, like, yeah. goody two shoes girl, I would have done it because I would have yeah. thought that's what I had to do. And that's where my discomfort comes from. Oh, exactly. No, it, it, there's nothing to make this scene comfortable, of course. But the other thing to remember is that Saturnine is a villain. And she is yes. deliberately yeah, trying yeah. to like villain seduce Kitty, getting her to mm-hmm. break rules and enjoy it. Um, so all these things are intersecting in ways that I'm I'm super not comfortable with. But I think I don't know. It's one of those scenes that really stands out for being so evocative in terms of the possibilities it presents. I mean, my my most my my super positive, you know, this is a great scene. Like argument for it would be that it's uncomfortable on purpose and it's uncomfortable in a possibly productive way. Because I mean, look at how many like things we're getting out of this scene just in this conversation to to this point. I have a question, I and I think so. it's going to put me very much on Team Stephanie here. And it might just be, I mean, just based on this conversation, the difference between the kind of person Stephanie and I are versus the kind of person Andrew and Anna. Right. Stephanie, you said reading this as an adult, you know, you get the sketchiness, right? And I think I got the sketchiness even at 16. Yeah. But even at 16, I knew that, like, I, I do agree with you. I do agree that this is Saturday, Saturday with Andrew. That this is Saturday night, Saturday night asking Kitty, do you win it, want in on this ride? I get that, like, Saturday night's a villain, but I also get that. At 16 years of age, as smart as I might have been, as, you know, gifted program, super intelligent, computer hacker boy that I was, if 40-year-old Courtney Ross came to me at that point, I would have known it was wrong and still said yes. That's who I was. So I, so the question is, you know, how legality aside, and it's something Claremont likes to deal with, right? How much can she consent? Good question. But yeah. also, Kitty is the kind of risk taker who is best friends with Wolverine. Like <laughs> she's a she's a weird kid, and so she's in a weird position where she might be the kid, or at least I read her because I want to identify with her too, right? So like I read her the way that I was at that point in my life, where I was very much a kid who is like okay i know i'm breaking a rule here i don't care I, you know i'm 16 i'm grown up i can break rules that's what i would have done but that's a I juvenile stance in itself right and I think, absolutely I think, and I think a 27 year old man sure <laughs> <laughs> like we talked Mojo Mayhem, Claremont was was having Kitty throw tantrums intermittently. So he is aware yes. that she mm-hmm. is yeah. young. A child. She is mm-hmm. is not, you know, advanced but beyond she's her not years. Aware. She just likes to be. Oh. Okay. Right. Okay. I agree with everything Andrew said. Uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure we have teams. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we have a, a great deal of agreement here. I agree with everything Andrew said about the the narrative use of symbolic consent with the icing. It's it's you know literally it's it's not okay i am seeing also that the way that we read not just that scene but this plot in which this attractive 40 year old who dresses like emma frost by the way um uh spirits kitty off to paris when she could say no but if she says no what's she gonna do she's in a country where all of her friends are off in another dimension she's not currently enrolled in school or employed uh, as far as she knows, uh, all of the people who've been her best friends for the la- since she turned 13 are either deceased or trapped in another dimension forever. What's she going to do? And uh, if she's in physical danger, she can just phase, right? Her default state is phased. But the real division I'm seeing here is between people who've had the experience of feeling physically endangered in seduction situations, or could easily imagine that, and people who have it. I've been lucky enough that you know, between how my adult life has worked out and uh, the fact that the people who raised me thought I was a dude until I was old enough to vote, I was constantly told, you know, look out for your friends who are girls because the patriarchal world puts girls in danger. 
I was not told you're in danger. I was not told watch out when you get in a car with a guy because it might not be safe and, you know, here's some mace. My relationship to the rape culture that we all still live in was not one in which I was taught to see myself as a potential victim. And that is an important division, I think, between the experience of me as one white gay trans woman and the experience of most cis women. And I think I don't go right away to, I am being victimized, I am in danger. I go to, ha, huh, this is a flirtation with an unethical adult. And I, I wanna acknowledge where I'm coming from and why I am able to see this in the way that I'm able to see it. And and I think we need to acknowledge where Claremont is coming from. Uh, you know, Claremont is someone who, as a writer, is constantly going out of his way to try to step outside being a dude. Um, and sometimes he can, and sometimes he can't. And maybe one of the ways we read this is, yeah, this is someone who's not quite seeing the amount of danger that a, an unethical seduction in real life can pose. Because mm -hmm. I... I haven't been seeing it and I don't know that Kitty's seeing it, but Kitty's, you know, real people can't phase. Yeah. She's literally invulnerable. At this point, yeah. She's invulnerable to anything that's going to happen to her in Paris. And she's invulnerable to anything that an unwanted sexual aggressor can do to her. She'll just phase and let the person fall on their face. Um, she's very vulnerable to other stuff. She's, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She's also yeah, vulnerable to not wanting to exist anymore. And we need to also talk yeah. that she loves this attention. She loves being able to dress up. She didn't think she could do it. She didn't think she could belong in this social space where people are using big words she hasn't heard it before and they want her to explain baseball and she has not been in a world where baseline humans have any interest in her for I don't know how many issues and she has as far as she knows no friends or allies on earth with the potential exception of some of the new mutants who she doesn't know how to find because no one in X books has phones. That's right. She also doesn't <laughs> yeah. like them. She hates them. <laughs> she well, she, she kind of does. She, 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 she likes them as children. Gone. Yeah. I mean, she's back and forth on that, but yeah, she doesn't want it. She really doesn't want to be with the new mutants and mm -hmm. her, she thinks the rest of her friends are dead. What she has to lose. Uh, Andrew, Aren't her parents in witness protection or something at this yes. point? Like literally, yeah. they're yeah, they're like in context. Yeah, she literally has nowhere to go. Yeah. She she yeah. says, I think she, I I reread uh, number twenty through twenty three to you know get ready to do this. Uh, it's on page and I think number twenty or I don't think it's in this issue. I think it's on twenty two or twenty three. She has a, a thought bubble. What else am I going to do? I don't want to go into witness protection, and if I go back to America, I will have to. But I mean, so many of the things that we're saying about this context kind of like makes my vulnerability argument though. Oh. She <laughs> doesn't have anybody else to rely on then that's like part of where my tension with this scene is you're, coming you're from. right like, oh god i'm just like hyperventilating <laughs> thinking about this level of vulnerability in this situation i think anna's absolutely right it's just that i also know that as book smart as i might have been as a kid i was also like i don't want to say i didn't know there was a danger to myself um i i was a black kid growing up in america in the 80s i obviously knew that i was in danger all the time but i also maybe naively stupidly believed in my own childlike inv in invincibility still in a way that kitty physically might actually for exactly the reason stephanie says kitty is i said literally invulnerable but stephanie pointed out physically invulnerable that doesn't mean that translates to actual invulnerability but i don't think kitty knows that because as grown up as kitty thinks she is as i've pointed out in the show before professor x is a jerk no professor x is right but kitty's never going kitty at this point in her life is never going to see that yeah and I, I totally get it yeah from the perspective of sort of kitty but i just yeah definitely it sort of makes me think back to kind of being 15 and just like that was the age where you were starting to be conscious of the creepy gym teacher and that kind of thing <laughs> and being told to like stay away from certain people and having to be hyper conscious of protecting your mm -hmm. body all the time so i think i just i have i mean I, I really appreciated what she said about it stephanie because that's definitely like that is so in my bones that like i just can't get away from wrong 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 danger you're putting yourself in danger and because that's Ooh. so 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 like beaten into my bones right we also have to acknowledge the dramatic irony she is in danger. Saturnine is a predator. Oh, She's yeah. a serial killer. <laughs> the readers were, were shown that very an clearly. intergalactic right? one. Yeah. She's, we, She's we in should, the most danger. I mean, do we also want to mention the fact that she's kind of a, a, a fascist Nazi kind of stand-in, yeah. which yeah, that has a context for this scene too, which we probably should mention. Well, and which we should because the book has not bothered to mention it literally in like 20 issues. 
but yeah, she is the worst possible person ever. They have not bothered to mention it, but there is a scene in this issue where they're having the champagne at the dinner table where she has her bracelet with the symbol that's kind of like analogous to like a swastika hanging from her wrist. So it the, the, the issue does make a point of emphasizing that to a degree. If you know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, that goes back to the Alan Moore comics. And go ahead, Andrew. Oh, I was just going to say on the other side of things, because there's all this like predatory stuff. We should also point out that the prologue to this book is probably a riff on Romeo and Juliet. The, the prologue to how is alike and this is two uh, women not yeah. alike so yeah. like is that setting up a love story i don't know I, I feel like i mean i sort of defer to you andrew but i also feel like when no, no, claremont wants to <laughs> when claremont wants to do literary i just taught the asgardian wars earlier this week so when claremont good. wants so to tell so you good. oh yeah it's, it's great when claremont, <laughs> when claremont wants to tell you that there's a literary illusion he will just lampshade it the pygmalion yeah he's not subtle enough <laughs> Uh, these are and these are are women who are visually similar. I don't th- I don't think it is two houses both alike in dignity, and I don't think this is a Romeo and Juliet story. I think it is a Pygmalion story, uh, and it is a story about impersonation on in both the A plot and the B plot. Can this woman pass as someone else? And the answer is you didn't think that they could, and it's kind of awkward, but they do, and they get what they want. Um, we should talk about things other than licking icing off fingers and going. <laughs> this is a great. The We're really pandering to the audience. Great. There's so much else happening here. Well, do we want to touch on other aspects of the Kitty story? Do we want to talk about the B plot at all? When she gets the car, that means everything to me. You know, what she likes in Courtney is Courtney acknowledges the adultness of her Mm -hmm. as a 15 year old girl, which is Mm -hmm. which is something 15 or 16 year old kid and oh I, and i went back we had, we had our thread on our twitter page but i went back and, and found claremont did specifically call her 15 right before she left the x-men i actually found the issue in like 215 so two years earlier he did say she had her 15th birthday it's it's a mess <laughs> don't worry about it um but like she is also the girl who always has always 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 just wanted to be treated like an adult and here is a real adult saying you know what i know you can't legally drive but you piloted a spaceship you know just don't get caught you'll be fine and it's someone acknowledging her capability Ugh, and is, i worked i worked is, I think, so hard to, to i worked so hard to pr manage like that scene where kurt doesn't let her drive the car and now i'm like shit it doesn't make any <laughs> sense <laughs> because, like, here's courtney treating her like an adult and kurt didn't do that specifically several issues before and i'm like damn it <laughs> it is of the nature of this character that no one really knows when to treat her like a child and no one really knows when to treat her like an adult there are wrong answers but it's <laughs> very rarely clear what the right answers are well i mean it's even complicated in this example because kurt was wrong to you know treat her like a child and say she couldn't drive the car but because he let her drive the car is the reason she ended up with satter courtney so it's like <laughs> multiple uh. things <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's weird because I also wonder if, you know, the her birthday situation, we joke about it, but her birthday situation is screwed up enough that it makes weird continuity problems like that happen, right? Like, it probably shouldn't have been too young to drive the car. In order to get her separated from everybody and, you know, the story needed to make her younger than we had been, than we as an audience had been treating her. And right. so, it, so it ends up with weird narrative conventions that, like, it's still a comic book and there's a little bit of hand waviness look like look she's a child okay i need her to be a child right now so she is <laughs> and, I, and i wonder if that is like sort of happening and i just i want those continuity mistakes not to matter because i'm running out of claremont issues i'm running out of davis issues entirely you know for a while starting today and i'm gonna run out of claremont issues fine soon and the t- continuity is going to get less tight and her ambiguous age is going to become a serious problem um, so like, I want things to be tighter yeah. than they are. Here's, here's a, here's a question that I haven't seen asked before. I want to acknowledge just how beautiful the Alan Davis art is, uh, where with the jazz club and with Paris X comics are guides to world geography for young readers. This is what Paris yeah. looks like when people say Paris is super romantic and everybody wants to go there. This is what they mean. And, uh, every Marvel comic could be someone's first. 
first. Uh, every depiction of Paris could be someone's first. This is a comic in which you're seeing, you know, why people want to go there. And, and I just want to acknowledge how beautiful this line art is. Mm -hmm. I also want to acknowledge editorial constraints because it's, I don't know, uh, maybe the answer is somewhere in the Claremont Papers at Columbia, but it's very easy for me to imagine the X office, Claremont and whoever's editing at this point, I'm afraid it's already Bob Harris. Um, maybe it's him. <laughs> uh, you know, somebody saying, I'm sorry, you can't make Kitty turn 18. You can't even make her turn 17. Mm. She has to be 15 forever because that is the age at which we expect our readers to want reader identification figures and you cannot make her older. Uh, you just have to make her turn 15 again editorial fiat it's quite possible and, and i mean there is sort of a self-reflexive comment on it at the beginning too where she's talking to to satter courtney and you know satter courtney says and i thought you were older than you looked and kitty says sure feels that way sometimes well, look, <laughs> look at her experience look at look at where she's been mm -hmm. um yeah. we should talk about fencing and dragons and <laughs> dressing up as her girlfriend and uh what is it captain simru um, <laughs> all of anna's favorite things <laughs> i love captain simru because i love captain simru because that's also part of the real world uh you know if, if you didn't have ninth grade geography uh or if you did but you didn't know about welsh nationalism you can look it up and now you know that there's a place called wales they speak welsh they don't necessarily want to be british and they certainly are never English. Mm -hmm. There's some real education going on here, and and uh, I love Captain Simru. I would like to see more of more of her. Yeah, I well, okay, let's talk about the Kurt and Megan thing because you know, like I'm the host, I'll defer to that being the thing that I want to talk about if we're running low on time. <laughs> but um, yeah, I really love this. I mean, I love Kurt saying it's what he's always wanted, which is amazing because there's so much going on that is so terrifying, and Kurt's like so excited, which is so in character for him andrew talked about in a previous episode the ways he models enthusiasm for the reader and i love that and this yes. is a perfect example of it but yeah megan becomes kurt but not in a kind of seductive romantic way but in a way that she is becoming kurt she's becoming mm -hmm. a fencer who is clearly a superior fencer to him because she is able to disarm this guy that kurt immediately lost to <laughs> and i love that mm -hmm. i really really love that i think it's actually i was gonna say i, I think if we want to speak symbolically because we do and we talk about sexual subtext all the time <laughs> like that that's a really intimate moment the, the idea that she would participate in kurt's fantasy like that and excel at mm -hmm. it and rescue him with it i think that's as mm -hmm. close to consummation as we're ever going to get in Excalibur between Kurt and Megan. It's such a little scene, but I mean, in terms of my hopes for what could be good about those characters if they were to get together and, you know, not necessarily like dating or whatever, but I mean, just to hook up in any capacity to have a sexual relationship of some kind, right? I mean, it's that way that there's like a shifting of identities going on here. You know, mm. Kurt tries to play the masculine role, like doesn't necessarily excel in this particular instance. Megan steps in to save him by participating in his role. And then we get afterwards, you know, him slung over her shoulder and just delighting in that yeah, right i just important. love that the huge smile like when they greet everybody and he's still flung over her shoulder that's just one of my favorite things that's like one of my panels that i i'm sure i included that panel in the first ever essay that i wrote about nightcrawler because i love it so much it's, but i mean yeah like I mean, in terms of like the shifting and sort of the ways that this allows megan for i would argue the first time to really because one of the potentials of her sort of playing with Kurt's identity is sort of the power that that can confer on her as this kind of transgressive, beautiful monster who's like empowered by monstrosity rather than diminished by monstrosity, which is an experience that she's had in the past. And even mm. Kurt's self-acceptance and kind of the way that he thinks about his own monstrosity is part of that empowerment. So her to feel mm. that physical empowerment that he has by taking on an active role when she transforms into him, it's not something we're going to see again ever. And it's a little thing in this oh. comic, but it is, well, I mean, we're not like with, <laughs> sad I hadn't realized I that. know I know but like we're not gonna see it again this is sort of this Aww. is sort of the height of Kurt and Megan and then we're gonna see it kind of slide off mostly um yeah but yeah until, I just, until the potential the of that yeah until until age of x-men yes oh yes. yeah yeah yes but not yeah not for the rest of this series and it's yeah. kind of it's almost sad too because it, this is a, a vestige of the changing artist and eventually the changing writer but you know We've talked in the past on past episodes where Megan's story can be inconsistent, where especially, you know, Megan's relationship with Rachel, we talked about they went from being best friends to hating each other again for a fill-in issue. And we're like, why? 
why did this happen? As we're going to change creative teams coming up, Megan's going to do what I consider a, li a little bit of backwards re regression in her personality, which is mm -hmm. kind of sad. And I her will symbolism say, too. Yeah, I will say some of her development that comes from the post, um, the post Claremont, post Davis times. I actually do like it's an alternate take and I think um, I like some of where she goes, but it's going to have to get worse before it can get better. So this is this is kind of a highlight for me just mm -hmm. seeing her be so confident. This is this is a Megan who is powerful. It's a Megan that if I don't know Claremont's leaving and I don't know Davis is leaving, I have hope for her future. Maybe she'll break up with Brian and things will be wonderful. Mm -hmm. and see. But like maybe, you know, there's, there's so much hope in this issue for that character. But it's so different than the way we talked about her back when we talked about Excalibur number four and some of the other Kurt Megan interactions where we talked about her reflecting him and not having agency because she was becoming mm -hmm. his fantasy. Like she is still becoming his fantasy here, but we see some of sort of once I was trying to say before is like the power that that fantasy confers, right? That like mm -hmm. subsuming Kurt's identity, becoming subsuming is maybe the wrong word, but becoming Kurt can have a power as well as, you know, she's not reduced to his fantasy. She's sort of embracing his fantasy as a power fantasy rather than just, you know, a reflection of him that doesn't have agency right there's agency to the ways she's claiming his identity here and i think and again it just him. really yeah exactly and it really i thought like she did it on purpose different. yeah she did it on purpose here yeah, rather yeah. than just yeah. like i'm standing too close to the horny guy so i have to which is what's been a problem <laughs> on the call boat. him that <laughs> no not just kurt i don't mean just kurt i mean literally yeah, anybody, any horny anybody, guy yeah. megan <laughs> megan turns into right, it's right. a thing that tap happens to her and that didn't happen here. Right here, she needed to be a swordsman. So who's the best swordsman I know? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll be him. Mm -hmm. Can we talk a little bit about Fake Kitty, who is Rachel? Yeah, we can. Because <laughs> I was interested in that too. We've had so many times in the series where Kitty has sort of dressed up as Rachel. And here we have Rachel dressing up as Kitty. So if you've got thoughts about it, Stephanie, I'll just put it open-ended. What are your thoughts about I, it? I do. Um, I had a kind of global thought about Kitty's relationship with the people she's closest to. And I thought that this would be an example of it and it's not uh the global takeaway is, is that kitty is is usually the least traumatized most able to pass and be normal person in a room full of badly traumatized mutants <laughs> and yeah. Her, yeah. <laughs> her relationship to the people she's closest to is very consistently i've had it better than you and i know it and i can help you mm -hmm. um and i think that's her relationship to rachel a lot and everybody's had it better than rachel and i thought that rachel would sort of enjoy dressing up as kitty the you know more normal one at, at the same time as kitty enjoyed dressing up as sophisticated grown-up sexy not kitty but when i went back and looked at the panels in which Rachel contemplates her costume. What I'm seeing instead is that Rachel does not believe that she can pass. Kitty is the passing mutant. Kitty is the mutant who passes as human. She's the mutant who passes through boundaries. She's the mutant who passes all her classes. Mm -hmm. um, Rachel is the is, is a mutant who is not used to passing. She can't pass as someone who's at home in this timeline. She can't seem normal in any way. She doesn't think that she can pass as Kitty. And her reaction for most of this dress up period is, huh. And when she, the few panels where she has to do this, and she does, like when she's talking to the customs inspector, she gives this kind of bratty, like, well, you know, I grew up. Mm. Um, and it passes as Kitty through being defiant. Um, and her wig falls off at one point, and she just sort of shows up with her normal hair. And the, the Masterix doesn't care because everyone's tired of the cross time caper. And she's just <laughs> saying, fine, go home, we're done here. I was expecting Rachel to enjoy pretending to be Kitty, and what I saw instead was a comment on who can pass and who can't pass and who feels like she mm -hmm. always sticks out which is mm -hmm. rachel yeah oh i love that stephanie and that's making me think back to the to the curtain megan thing too and i mean we don't have that playing out as clearly there but i have talked about to my mind one of the ways to make kurt megan work as well is sort of having to do with his fascination that he might have with shapeshifters and the opportunity to pass and hide that that entails that he doesn't have right yes with mm -hmm. the image inducer what he's sworn off of now right yes so i mean in terms of that being part of the seduction that megan holds for him so i mean when i think about him sort of on the ground watching Megan become him and fight as him and succeed as him that's very seductive in a way that I love and again it's not something that we see play out here because that all happens off panel but it's definitely something I'm inserting between the panels <laughs> I, I want to have a long footnote here about Uncanny 130 in which 
Kitty discovers what it's like to have to superhero. Dazzler takes the stage as a mutant performer, and Kurt says f this to his image inducer i'm never gonna yeah. do it again yep. all in the space of about four pages mm-hmm. that's not excalibur mm-hmm. it's a footnote mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah i know he's like and then we find out Ex- xavier has been forcing him to use the image inducer and it all happens in a yeah. thought bubble and we don't ever explore it again anyway um, <laughs> other things because we're running out of time which is fine but any things that we desperately need to talk about before we completely run out of time because there's just so much more we didn't talk about john Byrne making like another appearance in this yeah. book although it's quite Good similar one. to the other one that we have back in excalibur number 14 but if you have it's thoughts about joke. it we can throw them in yeah <laughs> it's the same joke it's like look we're, we're, we're doing a dig here i love it yeah i do love the superman costume <laughs> yeah is, I mean, is burn i actually don't know this is burn writing superman at that time yes yeah man of yeah. steel um yeah and actually to be honest doing an amazing job of doing one of the most <laughs> one of the most innovative t- innovative takes that on that character that had at to that point been done in 50 years so i mean yeah it was the, sort of the basis for lois and clark in a lot of ways so i you know i yeah, can't really and, hate on and, that hard yeah and much of what exists on superman in you know in all media to the day was defined between the years of 1988 and 1992 by John Byrne. <laughs> um, so I get the dig. It's funny. The thing that I wanted to bring up, though, this is really, I mean, in many ways, it's this is the end of the cross time caper. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And it's very fanfareless. <laughs> Abrupt. <laughs> it's sort of like it's. I mean, it it almost reads. I mean, we we didn't deal much with it, but honestly, the book doesn't deal part, much with it. This was supposed to be a nine part crossover. They realized during part two, I think, that it wasn't going to be nine parts, so they took away that that subtitle. And then it's just been we've been on this cross time caper. We've been on this cross time caper. We've been on this cross time caper, and now. Opal and Saturnine, the Omniverse of Majestics, the literal god out of the machine shows up and says, I'm tired of this. It's go done. Home. Go home. <laughs> and that's how it ends. It's like, done. It's, we're, we're, it's we're one done. of the no things, more. for me, it's one of the things that distinguishes Excalibur from other Claremont books and from other other books, that other comics, other superhero comics that are, are this high in you know, literary interest and imaginative interest other than uh, Gwenpool books. Um, because Excalibur is a comic book. <laughs> Part of the beauty of New Mutants is that it doesn't know it's a comic book. It thinks that it is Victorian realism with more punching or realist YA with more punching and everyone's problem is really, really serious. Excalibur has big feelings and beats and and serious questions, but it knows it's a comic book and it knows that some people with some pens and some typewriters can fix anything we really, really don't like. Mm-hmm. And it is is very, very, it, it likes to show that there's a person behind the curtain often, although, uh, and, mm-hmm. and, and the, the John Byrne appearance and the sort of shrug at the end where Rachel's wig comes off and Opal Luna Saturday says, I, I don't care. Um, <laughs> and even the, back to the A-plot, the, the wish fulfillment where Kitty gets exactly what she wants out of a night in Paris and it is the best and she's finally got the escape fantasy that she has had forever and that Mm -hmm. comics readers have although we like Gwenpool want to escape into the 616 and she would like to escape the 616 and go to a place (laughs) where she can just uh she would like to be able to go to jazz clubs go to cubs games have a girlfriend kiss her girlfriend on page and study a lot of physics and not be endangered every (laughs) two minutes um (laughs) This is her escape fantasy. (laughs) And it's as if she knew that she was in a comic book. Uh, And this is, I mean, the more I reread this and the more I look at this, the more I like it, Uh, even though the the seduction aspect is sketchy as all hell, the more I I feel like we are coming to the end of the cross time caper because we are coming to the end of an extended contemplation of what it means to have an escape fantasy and how an escape fantasy can be at once sketchy and wonderful and worth cherishing and also this is claremont saying i am so glad i don't have to work with john byrne ever again (laughs) (laughs) i am so done with that we actually do like a little later not not anytime soon i think there's one issue i think there's one uncanny (laughs) issue or something 
Andrew, any final thoughts you want to contribute to this conversation? I uh, just context. This is the first issue that where Excalibur is going twice monthly, which is mm. actually what would lead Davis to leave the book because um, mm-hmm. he didn't feel that um, the quality level could be maintained. Yeah, who would feel oh, that? We're gonna be sad to. How we're, yeah, we're gonna brutal. be sad to leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And there's some stuff coming up. Davis was right. The quality level. He really, yeah. he really was. <laughs> Come now. We've got some great guests coming on in the upcoming we do. issues. And we're going to oh, have no, some our great show stuff will be great. Yeah. <laughs> our, our show will be great. I'm saying the work did suffer. Yeah, yeah <laughs> he, that's he fair. Had a point. That's fair. Marilyn. If only you're at my side, my old friend. To give me courage. There are no war tricks that will fool Mordred and Morgana. More than I ever did, I need you now. Where are you, Merlin? If only you could. See me, wield Excalibur, once more. Okay, I know you've got to go, Stephanie. So we will we will wrap up. I definitely could talk about this for another three hours, but I wanted to give you a chance to plug some of your stuff that we didn't mention in your bio at the beginning. So Stephanie, if you would like people to find you online or elsewhere, where can they find you? And what things of yours perhaps relevant to today's episode should people check out? Thank you for asking. And th- this has been, this just makes me want to do this again. Uh, I know you've got a great lineup oh, of books, but this yeah. is so much fun. <laughs> And I'm I'm so so grateful to have been able to listen. And I'm now I'm afraid I talk too been talking too much. Um, just edit edit me out if you get too much me. Uh, please, I'm, my default state is phased. I'm, I'm used to. You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> You've been warned. No, um, you can find me on Twitter at Accommodatingly, A-C-C-O-M-M-O-D-A-T-I-N-G-L-Y, uh, which is my fairly public presence. And you can just look for Stephanie Burt um, and you'll find me and a very talented South Carolina-based food writer. If you can well <laughs> Accommodatingly, I'm on Instagram as not quite Hyde Park, uh, but that's I'm less active there. I have a brand new chat book, which just means a little staple bound 30 page book of poems out from Rain Taxi Editions in Minneapolis uh, called For All Mutants. And it is poems about X characters and Excalibur characters and also she characters. And there's uh, one about a DC character and one about a Buffy character, but, you know, super people in poems, um, including uh, a very free translation of a famous 19th century French poem spoken by Kurt Wagner, um, which I hope his unofficial PR agent you know, approves. <laughs> um, I have I have read it and it's unbelievably oh, beautiful. Thank yes. you. Uh, if you are looking for books about poetry, I have one called Don't Read Poetry, a book about how to read poems. And if you are looking for a book of very free translations from ancient Greek that is full of Easter eggs for X-Men fans, uh, that is a book called After Callimachus, published by Princeton University Press in 2020. And you also write for Comics XF. You're doing, what, New Mutants and I am, America Chavez, I'm perhaps? Co- I'm co-covering New Mutants, a book that I absolutely love. Love that I hope Vita Ayala never ever leaves. Uh, they are one of the best writers going. Um, I am currently covering Runaways, which is ending, and America Chavez, which is ending. And um, I hope something else with teen superheroes or queer people or both for Comics XF. Is that it for now? We will. Is that all? Yeah, we will link. We will link all of those things because okay. you do so many. Awesome oh, oh, things, oh! And but... there's um, there is going to be a book from Columbia University Press in 2022 or 23 uh, that I am part of the writer team on that is a book about how to read X-Men comics. Oh. Uh, so the contract has been signed. Uh, it is happening. Um, a piece of it has already appeared on Comics XF, and uh, we'll see where else it, it shows up. But there is a really stellar team that I'm happy to be part of. And I, 
I should apologize. Like it, this book was underway before the Claremont Road Twitter feed started, and before I was sort of aware of the some of the other amazing ex academic projects going on. And and you know, I hope we all launch on the same date. <laughs> <laughs> There can never be too many X-Men academic books, as far as I'm concerned. And we've all got lots of irons in the fire, so no no worries there. I'm very excited for that book. It sounds awesome. I, I just imagined uh, a panel of, like, Scott or someone saying, what am I going to do with 13 academic X books? <laughs> <laughs> Start a movement. Oh, oh my God. There was just, I, I, I'd forgotten that that was in that issue. How can we ever have 13 X-Men? Fast forward thirty years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's it's not even one book. Worth. In the issue we've been talking about, in which the, John Byrne complains yeah, that there are up. just too many character designs he has to keep track of, and it's uh, we're being told that that's why he left Marvel. Yeah. <laughs> on, that <How> <laughs> on that note, <laughs> thank you so much again for joining us, Stephanie. It's I'm so happy to be here. I hope I, I and you're. It's great company. <laughs> we feel exactly the same. Thank you again. Next, in one week's time, we'll be on to episode 26, in which we will be discussing Excalibur number 25. Guess who's coming for Phoenix? Spoiler, that's not a spoiler. It's Galactus. Also, Kitty gets sent to boarding school. I'm sure that'll go swimmingly. We won't be seeing Alan Davis again for a while, but hang in there because we've still got some great discussions and the usual bevy of super smart guests in store. In the meantime, if you liked what you heard, please follow us, like, and review the podcast wherever you're listening to it or watching it. Don't forget to check out our fabulous YouTube videos, which you can find via our website or the Vox Popcast YouTube channel. As always, if you want to chat with us about Excalibur or pitch yourself as a guest for a future episode, let us know. You can reach out via our website, goshgollywow.com, where we've got some fun extras, and via Twitter, at goshgollywow, where we post daily pages from whatever issue we're reading that week, and more fun extras. Thank you, Andrew and Mav, for another multifarious conversation. Thank you, Stephanie, for helping talk us through it. Thank you all for listening, and a special thanks to Maximilian of Thoughtform Music for our truly epic theme. Theme song. Play us out. <laughs> <laughs>